I want to talk today about uh, Celtic spirituality, and so I've changed the third reading, and I've introduced the oldest known poem in any Celtic language. It goes back to about 600 BC, and it's called the Song of Avergeen. And Avergeen was the leader of the Celts who came to Ireland in that year. And he's standing on the prow of his ship as the, this beaching on the southern coast of Ireland, and he pronounces this poem. And it's a deeply, deeply mystical poem. <clears throat> I am the lake on the plain. I am the defiant word. I am the spear charging into battle. I am the God who put fire in your head, who made the trails through the stone mountains, who knows the age of the moon, who knows where the setting sun rests. I am the wind on the sea. I am the stormy wave. I am the sound of the ocean. I am the bull with seven horns. I am the hawk on the cliff face. I am the sun's tear. I am the beautiful flower. I am the boar on the rampage. I am the salmon in the pool. A word inspired by God. About the year 600 BC, the Milesians, also known as the Celts, conquered Ireland. And the people who lived before them were called the Tuatha Dé Danann, the people of the goddess Dana. And the Tuatha Dé Danann, in their turn, had displaced an earlier race of gods who were known in Irish as the Fomorians. But the Celts came about the year 600 BC, and in two great battles in the same location, a place near County Sligo called Moitura, they defeated the Tuatha Dé Danann. And they came to an agreement, the two parties at the end of the second battle, they came to an agreement that they would share the land of Ireland between them. They were divided into two pieces. But it's not that one got the northern half and the other the southern half, or one got the eastern half and the other got the western half. They, did, they split it up in the following fashion. The Celts got Ireland above the ground, and the Tuatha Danann got Ireland below the ground. So they shapeshifted and be became what we call, in Irish we call, the she, the fairy folk. And that was the arrangement they made between them. But they continued, obviously, to interact and to influence each other. And that's the theme I want to take today. I want to talk about Celtic spirituality. What did these people bring, these Milesians, what kind of a cosmology or a thinking did they bring with them? And I'm going to divide the... Jerry? Where did the Celts come from? Uh, probably from the Balkans, originally. There's evidence about 1100 BC that they came from the Balkans yeah, and came across Europe going west and arrived in Ireland. First uh, in France, uh, conquered France, then England, Scotland and finally Ireland about 600 BC. Uh, so today I'm going to divide my talk into two sections. I'm going to talk about a pre-Christian Celtic spirituality, be the first section, and then secondly, uh, Celtic Christianity. But in case you think you're getting off lightly, in the first section I have four main points. <laughs> and in the second section I have ten main points. <laughs> so strap yourselves in, it could be a long ride. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let me start then and look at pre-Christian Celtic spirituality. And to understand this, you want to have to understand that the great wisdom keepers of the Celts, there were three great groups of wisdom keepers. And in fact, this is a cartography, or this is a kind of a taxonomy that was actually developed by Julius Caesar. You find it in the writings of Caesar. When he talks about the Celts, he talks about this kind of a, an arrangement, that the Celts had three levels of wisdom keepers. And they're called the Bards, the Ovids, and the Druids. And here was their functions. The bards were the keepers of the past. It was their function to keep the past alive. Now, to understand Celtic uh, spirituality, we realize that the time is not a linear thing. You don't go from the past to the present to the future. It's a cyclical thing. So if you go too far back into the past, you're into the future. And if you go too far into the future, you're into the past. So for the Celts, it's a cycle. But the function of the bards was to keep the past alive. And so they're the great storytellers, they're the great uh, uh, poets, they're the people, that, they're the genealogists, they're the historians, and their function is not just to inform their audience, it is to transform their audience. The difference between transformation and information is the difference between wisdom and knowledge. One is just about data and the other is about stuff that actually changes who you are. 
So the function of the bards was to keep the past alive and to transform the audience in the telling. And very often, they would either be associated with a chieftain, and they were part of the chieftain's household, and their function was uh, to create the genealogy, to remember the genealogy, to tell the history, and to, uh, to uh, tell the stories and the poems. But occasionally, there would be wandering bards as well, who were not attached to a chieftain, but who wandered around. So that was the first great group of wisdom uh, holders. The second group were called the Ovates, and the Ovates were the keepers of the future. And so, in some senses, these were the ones who spoke to the people on behalf of the gods. And so, modern words for them would be like, they were the prophets, you know, if you look at the kind of the Hebrew tradition, they were the Celtic equivalent of the prophets, or they're the shamans, you know, of the, of the Celts, or they're the seers of the Celts. And their function, particularly, was to steer people through rites of passage, you know, various uh, initiation rites, this was their, their forte. And then the third great group are called the Druids. And the Druid, in Gaelic, it's a very interesting, complicated word. It literally means the keepers of the wisdom of the trees. That's exactly what it means, the keepers of the wisdom of the trees. Because trees have a very, very spe special place in Irish cosmology. In fact, our alphabet, the oldest uh, written uh, language among the Celts was a language called Om, spelled O-G-H-A-M. And it was an alphabet of 20 letters. And there were strokes, and they were typically written on the corner of a standing stone. And each of these letters was the phoneme of the, the first phoneme in the pronunciation of the word for a particular tree. So 20 different trees are shrubs. When you, obviously, uh, spoken language came a long, long, long time before written language. So as you speak the name of the tree, the first phoneme, a phoneme is just a linguistic device where uh, the shortest sound possible. So if you make any word, it consists of phonemes. If I say, for instance, tomorrow, that consists of several phonemes, just pushed together, and I don't mean syllables, a single syllable could be several phonemes. Uh, so the shortest sound you can make, they took that sound from the beginning of the name for a tree, and that's how they created their alphabet. And so uh, they were the great keepers. Uh, the alphabet was, was the language uh, that, the, that the Druids use. So they're the language keepers. And their function is, um, they speak to the gods on behalf of the people, where the Ovids had spoken to the people on behalf of the gods. And the Druids are the really great, they're the great intellectuals of Celtic society. They have a very, very important place. And so, in fact, they're the judges. They're the lawyers and they're the judges for the group. They're also the philosophers for the group. They're the theologians for the group. They're the priests for the group. They're the scientists for the group. They're the astronomers for the group. And their function is to protect the present. And the present is this moment in time in between the cycle where past and future encounter each other. And so that's the great function of the Druids. So there were the three great groups of wisdom keepers in the Celtic world. Now, they lived then in a world which consisted of three different dimensions. And these dimensions were the heavens, the earth, and the underworld. And the heavens were, was where the gods and goddesses lived. And the earth was where human beings and animals hung out. And then the underworld was the place of uh, spirits and place of the ancestors. But in the Celtic system, these three dimensions constantly interwove. And in fact, when you see the very intricate Celtic knots, very often there's a three-party arrangement to it, which is why St. Patrick got immediate success when he held up the shamrock and talked about the three persons of God because the number three was very sacred to the Celts. So this knot between heaven, earth, and the underworld was a part of the Celtic mythology. So uh, the heavens are peopled by gods and goddesses. But it's not in the sense that they were not polytheists in the sense that they thought there were many, many different kinds of gods. Rather, the goddesses in the Celtic understanding are the archetypes of nature. So as you encounter nature in its various facets, you give a name to that facet, and you give it the name of a goddess. So the goddesses are really the archetypes of nature, mountains or streams or whatever. Now, I've said to you many times before, you get the same notion among the Aboriginal peoples of Australia, where they believe that the ancestors sang nature into being that it was the songs of the ancestors and the stories of the ancestors that actually manifested as mountains or streams or forests. 
And as I said to you before, an Aboriginal person would never ever think of climbing a mountain or forging a stream whose music he did not know. It would be total insult, it would be sacrilege to attempt to climb a mountain whose music you are not familiar with. Now, the Celts had the very same notion. So the goddesses are not kind of divinities in their own right. They're archetypes for various facets of nature. And the gods in the Celtic pantheon are not kind of what you find in Rome or Greece. They're rather, they're archetypes of humanity or archetypes of culture. And for the Celts, culture and nature are not enemies, as you find so often in the West, that we try to despoil nature, that nature is the enemy. For the Celts, uh, they were lovers. The gods and the goddesses were lovers because the gods were the archetypes of humanity or the archetypes of culture, and the goddesses were the archetypes of nature. So in some senses, culture is the human face of nature in the Celtic dispensation. They're not inimical to each other, they're not enemies of each other, rather they're lovers for each other. And so that's what the heavens were peopled with these archetypes. Archetypes of human culture and archetypes of nature itself. Then the earth obviously is peopled with humans and animals of various kinds. And then the underworld is the place of the ancestors and the place of the Tuatadanan, the place of the elementals, the fairies, who are shapeshifters. And there's a constant interchange between these three dimensions. They're not separated from each other at all. They're constantly interweaving with each other. And the whole purpose of ritual is to establish a known means of communicating and dialogue between these three facets. So there are the three groups that you find. Within Celtic spirituality, and there's a word I've used many, many times with you, in Gaelic we call it a coil oit, or a thin place. But the thin place was not just physical you know, locations. There were those. Uh, you've all traveled perhaps to places where they have a particular sanctity for particular uh, cosmologies. For instance, Jerusalem is, an, is a, a thin place for Judaism. Uh, Mecca is a thin place for Islam. Maybe Sedona is a thin place for Native American peoples. Uh, the Celts had many thin places, many places where the veil between the mystical and the mundane is diaphanous. And if you know how to shift your vision, you get to see through into the other side. But the thin places for the Celts were not just physical locations. There were many, many ways in which the veil opened up. So every single soul, as far as the Celts were concerned, was a portal. It was a thin place. Your own individual soul was a thin place that allowed you access through on a constant basis into the mystical, you know, from the, the mundane. They regarded nature as the greatest a thin place of all, the greatest highlight of all. So very, very many different parts of nature gave you access immediately to the mystical. They, they really uh, loved nature very, very much. They regarded the imagination as a portal. And I've said this to you many times that um, my definition of imagination is it's not that imagination is a faculty that allows us to make up stuff which is not real. That's not imagination. That's fantasy. It's very different. Imagination is that faculty which allows us to volitionally shift our state of consciousness, access different dimensions, interact with entities and energies in those other dimensions, and bring that knowledge and wisdom back and cross-fertilize it with waking consciousness. And so imagination was a very, very powerful tool for them. Also ritual symbols, when they engage in the rituals, so um, a waterfall, a forest, a stone, a tree, these became portals as well. Now I like to the notion of portals for the Celts, there's this notion of uh, liminality. Uh, limina is a Latin word meaning a threshold, a kind of a crossover place between the outside and the inside. And this was very, very strong for the Celts, and it's very much connected up with the notion of the thin place or the quailoid. But for instance, um, there was a part of the year which was liminal, which was a, a crossover threshold. And so the Celtic year began in Samhain. Samhain is the 31st of October, from which we get you know, the, uh, the Halloween uh, tradition. And it's the beginning of the darkness. So now you're going to have November, December, January, February, March, April. They're kind of the dark months in the Celtic calendar. And that's the beginning of the year. Samhain begins, uh, the, the new year begins with Samhain. So the, the first of November, literally, is the beginning of the Celtic calendar. And the second half of the Celtic calendar begins with Bialtana, the first of uh, May. And so uh, the beginning always starts in darkness. And darkness is not evil. It's not in the Western sense we think dark is evil. For the Celts, dark is not evil. It is the womb. It is the mystical womb out of which everything emanates. 
And so life always begins in darkness. The year begins in darkness. And the same thing with the day. The day you had dawn and dusk, but the Celtic day began at dusk. Now the Hebrews had the very same notion. And so what we would regard as 6 p.m. in the evening, uh, we think it's kind of mid-evening for the Celts and for the Hebrews, that was the beginning of the next day. The day began at like when the sun went down. When darkness began, the new day was being gestated in order to be born. And so the darkness always preceded the light. And they're not inimical to each other. They're not, you know, adversaries to each other. One is the womb which gives birth to the other. And they're the kind of the male and the female principles again. You know, again, you get the god, goddesses. That the goddess represents darkness as in mystery and potential and womb. And the god represents that which comes from it, the light that emanates from that. So the notion of liminality is very, very strong there. But the single most important uh, a facet in Celtic spirituality is definitely its regard for nature. Nature is precious to the Celts for several reasons. Firstly, because it is our mother, it's part of our family. In its own right, it deserves you know, to be, be worshipped. Also, it is the gateway to the metaphysical. It is only by understanding and engaging with nature that you have access to the metaphysical. So the Celts had a tremendous uh, respect for nature. So much so, in fact, that when an Irish king was being installed, there was a whole ceremony. There was a stone, a very special stone. In Irish, we call it the Leo Foyle, uh, the stone of destiny. And it was actually given by the Tohe de Danann to the Celts. And it was the place in Tara, in uh, County Meath in Ireland, where the high kings of Ireland were installed. And the system went like this. This stone had magical properties. So if there were five or six contenders wanting to be high, the next high king, they would approach the stone and touch the stone. And when the, st when the stone sang in response to the touch, the indication was, this is the one whom I have chosen. So it was called the Leofoil, the stone of destiny. But immediately following this choice, the ceremony needed, the king had to be married to the land. And there was an actual ceremony in which the king is married to the land. It's the god and the goddess. He cannot be king. The first stage of kingship is being chosen by the, the stone of destiny, but the culmination of it is the marriage to the land. And if the king proved to be a worthy ruler, there would be plenty in the land. If he proved to be a very bad ruler, there would be famine in the land. So there's a great story of a particular Irish king um, in English, his name in English will be translated as uh, Nile of the Nine Hostages. And he's a king in Ireland roughly around 480, roughly around the same time as St. Patrick. And there's a great story told about him that he and his brothers, before he became king, he was just a warrior, and they're hunting all day. And they're very, very tired and very thirsty. And they come, come to a well, and they want to drink from the well. But there's this old hag over the well with her walking stick and a long, big pointed chin and a snot in the end of her nose. And uh, they go to drink from the well, and she says, no, this is my well. You're not allowed to drink from it, unless you kiss me. Yes, give me a break. I'm going to kiss you. <laughs> so they all go away one by one. And finally, Neil agrees to kiss her, and he kisses her, and she transforms totally. So it's like the opposite of the, 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 the princess and the frog. It's the Irish version, a much older version. She transforms, and she is the embodiment of Ireland. And so he's, he becomes king in marrying her. So that's the, that's the kind of the origin then of Celtic spirituality. That's where they put their emphasis. That's my first point. The second point I want to look at then, what happened then when Christianity encountered this kind of cosmology? And uh, to, to set, a, set it back in context for you, I want to say that the transition point between uh, pre-Christian Celtic spirituality and Celtic Christianity is storytelling. That which weds the two together is storytelling. And there are four great phases in Irish storytelling, when you look at the transition. Firstly, as I said to you, the bards were the great storytellers for the Celts. They were the ones who kept the past alive, not just to entertain, but uh, to kind of transform, not just to inform, but to transform, very important. Now, the bards intentionally never wrote the stories down. This was a decision, never to write the stories down. Now, you can think of three different possible interpretations of that. You can say that this was a control mechanism, that the, that the bards wanted to keep you know, uh, control over the populace, and that only they know the stories. By not committing them to writing, they were keeping to themselves. You could say that that's true. Or you could say that, um, to quote the Hebrew scriptures, it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 
And the bards knew that for somebody unpreparedly to encounter a mystical occasion, one of two things is going to happen, inflation or madness. I heard a great story one time being told by Elie Wiesel, this great uh, Jewish hero. He said in his village in Poland, you know, right before you know, the, the Holocaust had begun, a rabbi taking them t uh, away, two, uh, several young boys. And within Judaism, it was verboten to teach uh, Kabbalah to anybody under 40. And the reason was Kabbalah is such a deep mystical thing that if you encounter it and are not prepared for it, one of two things is going to happen to you. You're going to get inflated with this amount of you know, esoteric knowledge you've acquired or else you're going to go mad because it is so intricate. So they would never teach Kabbalah to anybody under 40. But because of what was happening in Europe, they began teaching it to these young boys. And Elie Wiesel said there were three of them being taught by the rabbi and two of them went mad. He survived, the only person who retained his sanity and came through the other side. So you could say that that's what the Celts, what the Bards had in mind, that this esoteric knowledge is sacred, not just secret, but sacred, and that for an uninitiated person to encounter the mystical will have one of these two. So you could say that was the reason they didn't commit it to writing. Our third interpretation would be to say that they wanted to keep this tradition organic. So when you commit it to writing, you kind of set it in stone. Literally, if you're a Celt, you're setting it in stone, on a gnome stone. And so by not committing it to writing, you're letting it continue to evolve and to, to, to develop. So that was the first stage of, of storytelling. That's what carried over into Celtic Christianity. Then in the 1200s particularly, the Christian monks began to record all of this in a combination of Irish and Latin. And very, very, very often, the hymnology of the time and the writing of the time will be in two languages. It'll be in, in a Celtic language, like, like uh, Irish, and also in Latin. And they began to record all these great... The Book of Kells is such an example, that they're recording all of these stories with commentaries. Of course, at this stage, they're beginning to kind of interpret and censor, in some senses, the older stories. They're trying to Christianize the older stories. But at least they kept it alive in, in transition. Then, after that period of time, there were what we call in Ireland, Ireland the Shanachai. A Shanachai is the storyteller, the, lower, the local village storyteller. And these kept these stories alive, you know, throughout the ages. My grandfather was such a storyteller. He had hundreds hundreds of these stories. And then in the 18th and 19th century, uh, some people began to collect these stories and put them in written form. And when the phonograph was invented in the 1940s, they began to record the voices of these Shanachais. And I had the privilege in 1970 of meeting an old man called Seamus O'Dellerga who had founded the Irish Folklore Commission in 1922. And he sent out, the, through the primary school teachers, he'd send the kids out to their grandparents to collect these stories. And over the course of 20 years, they collected 1.5 million manuscripts of pages. Irish folklore has the biggest written collection of folklore anywhere in the world. And when the phonograph was invented, the phonograph, they sent out people to record the voices of these Shanachis. And so uh, there's a huge collection in the Irish Folklore Commission of this mythology. And then we have modern Irish storytellers as well. So it was the storytelling that allowed this you know, evolution, this almost seamless transition between pre-Christian Celtic spirituality and uh, Roman and, and Christianity, Celtic Christianity. Now, um, in, in Celtic world, then, we talk about the Six Nations. Uh, the Celts uh, ultimately resided in six locations in Western Europe. There was a colony in Brittany, in France, and then there was a colony in Cornwall, which is the southwest corner of England, and then there was a colony in Wales, which is western part, and there was a colony in the north, in Scotland, and then there was a colony on the Isle of Man, which is an island between England and Ireland, and then there was a colony in Ireland. So they were, they were called the Six Nations and they were Celtic speaking. Unfortunately, the language began to die. In fact, the last speaker of Cornish in Cornwall died in 1800, and the last speaker of Manx, the Isle of Man, died in 1974. But there are communities in the other four countries that still, still maintain us. So in Ireland, there are about 20,000 people whose mother tongue is Gaelic still. Now, uh, allegedly, most people who've been educated in Ireland should be bilingual. They should have a working knowledge of Irish and of English. But there are about 20,000 native Irish speakers left in the country. In Scotland, there are about 30,000 native Scots Gaelic speakers left. In Brittany, amazingly enough, there are 250,000 native speakers of a Celtic language in Brittany, in northwestern France. 
but uh, Wales is better than that even. There are 330,000 native Welsh speakers in Wales right now. So they're called often in the Celtic world, they're called the, uh, the Six Nations. So that was the transition between the two. The language and the storytelling is what allowed the uh, cosmology to transition from uh, pre-Christian Celtic roots to uh, Celtic Christianity. So then, how did the Celts encounter Christianity for the first time? And there are four uh, different possibilities, there are four different kinds of storylines. And the most fascinating one is that um, the Celts encountered Christianity while Jesus was still alive. There's a great story associated with Glastonbury in England, a very power, great power spot in England, that Joseph of Arimathea, who was the one who took Jesus' body down off the cross finally, that Joseph of Arimathea was a very, very well-traveled businessman and that he constantly had business in England around Glastonbury and that he took the boy Jesus as a 12-year-old kid to Glastonbury on a regular basis where he encountered the Druids and so that the boy Jesus actually encountered the Druids on a regular basis on these business trips with uh, his uncle or whatever relationship Joseph Arimathea had to him. So that uh, Celtic uh, spirituality met early Christianity even before the Jesus movement per se was set up. That's one story. A second story is that it came through Mary of Magdala. So that after the death of Jesus, so let's say 33 AD, that Mary of Magdala uh, sailed across the Mediterranean and established herself in France. And in actual fact became, uh, one story says that she was carrying a child of Jesus, a girl child. And that that became the beginning of the Merovingian uh, lineage in France that ruled France for about uh, eight centuries until the Carolingians uh, took over. So the Merovingian line was there first. So that's the second notion, that the, the Gaulish Celts encountered Christianity literally within uh, two or three years of Jesus' death. That's a, a second possibility. There's a third possibility, and it's that uh, Christianity in Ireland came from Egypt, not from Rome, but from Egypt. And that hermits, desert fathers and desert mothers who lived in the desert in Egypt were seeking more and more remote locations to practice being hermits. And that they sailed across the Mediterranean, out through the Straits of Gibraltar and up along the west coast of Europe and found Ireland and established little enclaves or individual hermitages. So that's the fourth, that's the third story. And, but the one that you mostly heard was that it was brought by St. Patrick in 432 AD. Now, there's a lot of evidence that it was, it was well established in Ireland long, long, long before that. But whoever established it, it's definitely a fact that the organization of Christianity in Ireland was very different from the Roman model. In Rome, you had parishes and dioceses. You did not have that in Ireland originally. You had individual hermits living in very remote areas in the forest. And when people got to aware of these holy men and holy women, they wanted to be associated with them, particularly in death. And so when somebody would die in the community, they'd want to bury their dead around the hermitage. So it's interesting that the Irish word kill, which spelled C-I-L-L, -L, has uh, two meanings in Gaelic. It means a church or it means a graveyard. So when you hear an Irish place name, like Kildare or Kilkenny or Killarney, the kill means the church of or the graveyard of. And so they would bury their dead around where the hermit was. And so the organization of the, of the uh, Irish church was very, very different from the organization of the Roman church. And this obviously did not go down very, very well. So Rome made an effort to kind of Romanize the Celts. So there was a very famous council in the year 664 at a place called Whitby in no the northern part of England. And they were trying to resolve this issue of Celtic Christianity versus Roman Catholicism and particularly around the issue of Easter, because the Celts celebrate Easter differently from the Roman world. The Celts followed the Gospel of St. John, and the rest of the Roman world followed the teaching of Peter. Now, according to the, the uh, New Testament, um, the final Passover was celebrated on the first month of the Jewish calendar, Nisan, 14th Nisan. The first month, first month in the Jewish calendar, uh, the 14th of Nisan was the, great, the, the day of the Passover. And so uh, Celtic Christianity celebrated Easter on that day, following the Gospel of John. The, the Roman uh, church followed a different uh, uh, calendar. And so Rome is now trying to lick these people into, sta into, into shape. And it's an Irish monk called Aidan, who was uh, based in Iona, a little island off the coast of Scotland that had been uh, Christianized by Irish monks. He's advocating uh, for the Johannine, for the John one, and somebody else is advocating for uh, the Petrine one. 
And finally, the king makes the decision, the king of the area. He believes that Peter has uh, preeminence and therefore they'll have to change uh, over to Peter's calendar. But that happened in England. Uh, it didn't happen in Ireland. For hundreds and hundreds of years after, the Irish continued to follow their own calendar. So that's kind of the origins of it. Now, how did the Celtic cosmology then influence the uh, Christianity as practiced in Ireland, uh, Celtic Christianity? For one thing, it was a very, very mystical kind of Christianity, not dogmatic, where you had Roman Catholicism was based on creedal formulations. The first thing that the Emperor Constantine did once he had allowed Christianity to become a state religion was to convene the very first council of the church at Nicaea in 325 AD. And he insisted that they stay in council until they hammered out a creedal formulation that everybody could get behind. He was looking for some kind of organizing principle that would keep his empire together, which was crumbling under the assault of the Germanic tribes. And in fact, he moved his empire to Constantinople himself. And so that council produces the Nicene Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, etc. The Celts didn't buy into that at all. So the, Celt, the Celtic spirituality was not based on creedal formulations. It was not belief, based on belief systems. It was based on personal experiences. And so it was a very, very Gnostic or a very noetic kind of spirituality. And it's very much based on love rather than fear or sin. So there's a huge controversy, in fact, raging through Europe around the time of Augustine. There was a great Irish scholar called Pelagius who was advocating for uh, respect for nature, you know, equality of women, primacy of love, whereas Augustine was insisting on the notion of original sin you know, and the subjugation of nature. Unfortunately, Augustine won out and left his imprint on Roman Catholicism in Europe. But the Celtic Church continued to honor this mystical, loving tradition. And the, Celts, uh, the Celtic Church was literally, it was a church of the people. So in Ireland, we have several different names for church. Sometimes a church is called uh, Aglish, which is a kind of a transliteration of the Greek, Ecclesia. Sometimes it's called Temple, from the word temple. Sometimes it's called Chapel, from the word chapel. In Scotland, often it's called Kirk, from the word church. But all of these were imported names. The real name of the church in Ireland was Tach and Fubbel. And Tach and Fubbel literally translates as the house of the people. So it was literally the place where people came. Now it's interesting to me that you have, in Ireland you have Tach and Fubbel, which is the house of the people, and you have the public house. And Irish life revolves about around these two. And I'm not being facetious in some senses. The public house in Ireland was literally the place where culture got passed on. It wasn't just a place to drink yourself silly. It was a place for stories, it was a place for uh, music, for poetry, for sharing yarns, you know. And Tach and Fubbel, the church, was the place for you know, with the Druids. So the Druids, you know, their, their Tach and Fubbel was the church, you know, and the Bards, their Tach and Fubbel was the public house. And between these two, for hundreds and hundreds of years, Irish culture proceeded apace, and Irish spirituality. So it's very much uh, an affair of the people. Very, very much as well, you get the notion of um, the equality of genders. In Ireland, one of the greatest uh, leaders of Irish spirituality is a character called Bridget. And Bridget flourished about the sixth century. And she was an abbess and she was a bishop. She presided over a huge big monastery consisting of monks and nuns. And she was the, she was the bishop over the whole thing. And in fact, there was, from the 5th century to the 17th century, there was an eternal flame burning. You know, she was based in a place called Kildara, which literally translates as the church of the oak tree. The oak is very, very important in, in Druidical thinking. And there was an, an eternal flame kept alive from the 5th century to the 17th. And then when the Protestants came in, they extinguished it. This was too much a worship of this pagan goddess, you know, and an eternal fire. Only God deserves eternal fire. And it was out. Until the 20th century, it was relit you know, on Irish independence. 1922, the fire was, re was relit. And so the place of, of, the, of the feminine face of God was hugely important in uh, Celtic spirituality. It changes, however, you know, when you come up into the penal times, when finally uh, Roman Catholicism was suppressed in Ireland in the 1700s, uh, the late 1600s, early 1700s, and it became illegal to be a Catholic in Ireland. And so priests were killed on sight, and it was not permissible to celebrate Eucharist. And so now Irish men were trained in Europe, at Louvain and in Spain, 
yeah, to, and would sneak back into Ireland, you know, as kind of uh, vagabond priests wandering around saying mass, you know, in, on mass rocks and in forests and places like that. Unfortunately, in the 1800s and late 1700s, 1800s, Roman Catholicism underwent a puritanical purge under a, um, a Dutch bishop called Jansen. So there was a movement spread called Jansenism that created a real puritanical version of Roman Catholicism. And Irish priests are now being educated in that format. So in 1829, when the act of Catholic emancipation was decreed by the British Parliament and it became legal again to be a Catholic, they established a big um, seminary in Ireland in a place called Maynooth. And this now was the professors brought in there had been subjected to Jansenistic thinking. And so the brand of Christianity, Roman Catholicism that I grew up with, and you grew, grew up with if you had Irish priests attending to you, was an aberration. It was a total aberration that repressed the feminine, that, repressed, that was fixated in sexuality and repressed nature. And then they sent missionaries to the English-speaking world, and you got the benefit of them here, in Australia, and in England. Irish priests were now bringing a bastardized version of Roman, of uh, Celtic spirituality uh, to, the, to the hinterland. So that's what, what happened, unfortunately. Now, in, in all of that, there still there was a core love among the people themselves and an understanding of nature. And I'm going to go back to the Hebrew Scriptures for a few moments to establish this. In the very first book of the Hebrew Scriptures, in Genesis, in um, chapter 3, there's this notion where God, using a Hebrew word, says, I give you rada over nature. Speaking to Adam and Eve, he says, I give you rada over nature. Now, in Hebrew, rada has three different meanings. It can mean, uh, I give you control over, I give you the right to the spoil, or I give you responsibility for. Now, unfortunately, uh, monotheistic religions have always chosen the third meaning of that word. So we think that nature is a resource that we're allowed to control, exploit, and even despoil. And in some versions, it's actually evil, and we need to oppress it. That was not God's intention, as far as I'm concerned. There's a lovely story in, in the book of Genesis as well, where God, having created all of the other animals, invites Adam and Eve to name them. Now, if you understand the Hebrew, and you understand the Hebrew cosmology, naming something is not just hacky, handy, hanging an identity tag on something. To name something means to be in connection with its essence. The name represents the essence of that with which you're in a relationship. And so the invitation extended by God to Adam and Eve was not to hang identity tags on an, you know, an alligator or a giraffe or a mountain lion or whatever. It was to say, can you see the essence of this creature and can you be in relationship with it? Now the Celts got that in spades. The Celts totally understood that we have this relationship with all of nature. That is an essence to essence relationship. So it's really, really, really deeply honored. And so it kept, it still stayed alive, even under kind of the, kind of the, the imposition of a Roman, Jansenistic, Puritanical thinking in the 1800s and 1900s. i make two final points. There's this beautiful notion in Celtic spirituality. You've heard it, there's a famous book written by John O'Donoghue with the title called Anam Chara. And Anam Chara is literally translated as soul friend. Now soul friend in Gaelic is not the same thing as a soul mate. We think a soulmate is a romantic partner, a twin flame, you know, and that's fine. But the Irish has a much, much bigger understanding than that. Um, anam, your anamachara could be a father-son relationship. It could be best friends relationship. It could be romantic partners relationship. But it's not confined to any of these. It is an agreement whereby two souls are spiritual directors for each other. They're counselors for each other. It's like the core of, you've heard me speak many times, of the preconception contract that we make before we incarnate. So the Anamachara are, is a very, very special intimate connection between two souls who agree to be spiritual directors for each other. Whatever form the physicality takes, whether it's father, son, as I say, or best friends, or husband, wife, or lovers, whatever, that's going to be beside the point. The main point of it is that these are two souls committed to being directees and directors for and of each other. And so the very famous Saint Bridget back in the 500 said, um, a person without an Anamachara is like a body without a head. And throughout, you know, you know, mystical spirituality, you find it happens again and again and again, like St. Francis and St. Clair, this kind of anamakara. And the last point I'll make is this. There is a kind of a Celtic diaspora 
You know, we talk about the Jewish diaspora where uh, Judaism was scattered to the winds. You know, when uh, Jerusalem fell in the year 70 AD under the uh, assault of the Romans and uh, Judaism got scattered throughout, throughout the world. So it's called the Jewish diaspora. There's a Celtic diaspora as well. So in the 1700s when uh, Christian, when Celtic Christianity got you know, oppressed in Scotland particularly and in Ireland, there was a mass exodus and they carry this with them. This was before it had been Romanized, you know, after 1829. And they carried it to the English-speaking world in particular. And so in some senses, I think the Celtic diaspora has done for our world what Tibetan Buddhism has done. When, when Buddhism, when Tibet was invaded in 1959 and the Dalai Lama had to flee, and we got introduced for the very first time ever to Tibetan Buddhism, this beautiful spiritual system. Or you look at what happened to the Native American Indian cosmologies, how it got oppressed by waves of colonialists, and now we're beginning to discover it again. And so I have this vision that uh, uh, Celtic spirituality and Native American Indian tradition and uh, Tibetan Buddhism are like a leaven that will continue to change our world. So as an Irishman in exile, it's been my privilege and my mission for the last 30 years to try to be one of those smugglers trying to smuggle Celtic Christianity into the monotheistic religions and trying to, to smuggle a love of nature into the Western culture.